Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Agrima Mian, and I'm a third year Hemonk Fellow at the Cleveland Clinic, um, also Chair of ASH Trainee Council. Uh, and it is my distinct pleasure to be talking with Dr. Sam Yamshan. Uh, Dr. Yamshan is a lymphoma specialist and assistant professor of medicine at NYU and also the director of cellular therapies at NYU. Um, Thank you for taking the time to talk to us, Dr. Yamchan. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of exciting new data presented at ASH this year um, within cell therapies um, and what and lymphoma. So would you be able to share with us a little bit about, uh, let's start with mental cell lymphoma. Uh, so we heard about uh, novel BTK inhibitors. And uh, so Sunrotoclax seems to be the new kid on the block. Um, what is your take on the data presented about Sonotoclax and where do you see that fitting in um, in the treatment algorithm for mental cell? Yeah, no, it's it's great. And and one one thing that's kind of I think funny about about you know BCL2 inhibitors right now we have Venetoclax, but actually it's technically still not FDA approved for mental cell lymphoma. And so sometimes even even now I'll I'll struggle to get it from it from from insurance companies. And so having having a, a BCL2 inhibitor that's now kind of uh, is being evaluated by the FDA for approval in mental cell lymphoma, I think, I think is very exciting. Um, and so today we saw some of that data and, and um, the data actually looks quite interesting. Sonrotoclax as a, as, as a single agent in a heavily pretreated population um, had, had pretty decent response rates, including some durable CR, um, which, you know, in a, in a disease like mental cell lymphoma, especially for patients who have had uh, BTK inhibitors and in some cases, multiple BTK inhibitors prior, um, you know, is exciting uh, efficacy to see as a single agent. Um, another thing that I think was exciting about it is actually the toxicity profile in that um, there were very, very low rates of tumor lysis syndrome, um, relatively low rates of infections, which we know uh, is, is an issue with uh, BCL2 inhibitors. Um, I think one thing that I'm excited about uh, in terms of, um, you know, a, a new BCL2 inhibitor is where we've really seen venetoclax uh, and I guess BCL2 inhibition as a class shine has been in combination. And, and um, especially, you know, a, a regimen that uh, people are very excited about are coming some of these frontline regimens, especially for, you know, these high risk TP53 mutant uh, mantle cell lymphomas, you know, the bovin regimen, the, the MAVO regimen, things like that. And um, I, I think that if we have kind of a new, a new, BCL2 inhibitor, we can, we can potentially do even better uh, with some of these regimens that are already very exciting in, in mental cell. And so I'm really excited to see uh, how, how it shines with some of its friends moving forward. That's a really, really great point. And I, I, as you said, I, I think uh, the study was monotherapy um, of Sonrotoclax and Boven, those all combination treatments. And certainly I think clinical experience, I don't know what your experience been, but in my limited experience, I've seen a lot of toxicity with some of those combination regimens of BCL2 inhibitors. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely the case. And, and uh, you know, it do sometimes require frequent dose reductions, modifications, even, even cessation. And so um, one, one thing that's, I think, exciting about Sunrotoclax is a, is a short half-life. And so, um, you know, that, that may potentially reduce toxicity. Remains to be seen. We, we need more trial data, but, but certainly, uh, certainly my interest is peaked. <laughs> well, that's the start. So we'll see where um, that, you know, how that story evolves. Um, moving on beyond mental cell lymphoma, so there's also been a lot of other exciting new advancements in the lymphoid malignancy space. Um, there was a plenary on CLL, and there's also a lot of other data uh, across board. So if you were to maybe give us one or two, or maybe one or two takeaways, um, uh, what do you think would be the most practice changing, like immediately practice changing uh, takeaways from this ASH meeting for lymphoma for the community oncologists? Yeah. So, so one, one thing that uh, I think has really struck me this ASH is that we've gotten a lot of data really just continuing to showcase the efficacy of bispecific antibodies uh, in both indolent lymphomas and aggressive uh, B cell lymphomas uh, in, in several different settings. I think one that everyone is kind of like everyone raised their eyebrows was epcaritimab and R squared, um, which uh, I think you know has made waves, beating uh, R squared with with a hazard ratio of of less than 0.3, which is just just uh, a really remarkable yeah. uh, efficacy, incredibly high response rates with with durability. Um, 
And we've also, uh, you know, seen at this ASH several presentations of bispecific antibodies in even in the front line in aggressive lymphomas in unfit, frail patients, where we right now are, are treating those patients potentially with our mini chop or other regimens that that may be less effective and seeing again, very remarkable response rates, durability and and um, limited limited toxicity. Um, and so I, I, I think I think moving forward, you know, the those are areas of interest. And I think I think that bispecific antibodies have really shown themselves to be maybe even the, like the biggest player in 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 B cell lymphomas in general. And moving forward, I think the question is going to be again, you know, we talked earlier with the Sun about playing well with its friends. Right. right? So, for example, with the epcritimab and R squared, mm -hmm. you know, is that lenalidomide necessary? Right. Like is do, do are, are we getting all of our efficacy from um, the bispecific antibody? And can we maybe reduce or or get rid of the len entirely and still see the same efficacy? And in the, those, um, you know, those frontline DLBCL studies, uh, several different combination regimens, which one is ideal? Um, do we, you know, thinking about uh, time limited therapy versus there's many, many, many unanswered questions still. But I think I think the future is very bright. That's a great point. And I think um, some of these data, as they're evolving very rapidly, uh, do you think a lot of this is going to be translated into um, uptake in the community? Do you, do you think a lot of community hematologists, oncologists will be become more comfortable with um, treating patients on bispecific antibodies over time? That, that, that's a fantastic question. And maybe the million or hundred million dollar question uh, with, with with these medicines. I, I've... Uh, interfaced a lot actually with uh community groups um you know both both in kind of i'm based in the new york area so locally but also actually around the country doing kind of these like uh almost like barnstorming tours with with local practices even in some kind of more rural far-flung areas and one one thing that has really struck me is that as we get more indications for bispecific antibodies um i think i think a lot of practices are realizing that um, you know, just like, you know, they got used to giving rituximab when it first came out, just, just like they got used to giving ADCs, new drugs are scary until you do them and then, and, and then they're not. And, um, I actually think that for me, one of the big turning points, and I know that we're talking about lymphoma right now, but one of the, the big turning points was actually the approval of tarlotamab, which is the bispecific antibody for small cell lung cancer. And I think that once, uh, for a lot of, for a lot of practices, once they realized oh, wait a minute, we're having bispecific antibodies and solid tumors too. We need to learn how to use these. And a lot, uh, I'm seeing a lot more colleagues who start, are starting to feel a lot more confident in managing these toxicities, giving outpatient treatment and, and being able to do bispecific antibodies. And I think, I think that my, my sense is that we'll see a lot more uptake in the coming years, as, both as we get new approvals, but also just as people get more comfortable. That's actually a great point, and I and I think that um, uh, I think currently, you know, we're all already seeing the explosion of bispecifics into earlier lines of treatment. So there has to be a translation into uh, getting these treatments closer to patients, and uh, instead of having patients come closer to where these treatments can be effectively delivered. That's exactly right, and and increasing access is really the name of the game, right? Like the, these drugs are very effective, and we want as many people as possible to be able to get effective drugs. Thank you, Dr. Yamchun. This was a very uh, enlightening discussion. And uh, any last words, um, anything else that um, you think we should be looking out for for the next day or so at ASH? Well, I think, uh, as I said, I think, I think the future is bright and there's a lot of very innovative, cool, uh, both, both clinical work and, and preclinical science going on. And so I'm excited to see what the next few years bring. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening.